Hey guys, I'm Philip Molina and Supergirl season two is about ready to drop on us, but like me in sixth grade, after one year of working just so hard to establish itself and get over some initial awkwardness and developing some relationships I've really cared about, it's been yanked up and it's moving to a brand new home. That's due to some budget issues and my mom's boyfriend, Carlos, for me, thank you, Carlos. Now, here's the thing. The new home to Supergirl is the CW, which if you're not familiar, is already home to a lot of DC Universe superhero shows. On Tuesdays, we have the adventures of the Scarlet Speedster himself, The Flash. On Wednesday nights, we watched the grittier compatriot Arrow, and on Thursdays, we travel through time with the crew of the Wave Rider on Legends of Tomorrow. And all of those shows, they're in the same fictional universe. They're all mangled together. We affectionately call that the Flareoverse. Now, with another DC icon and Supergirl joining the lineup on Monday nights, she's basically about to become essential viewing for anyone who is trying to keep up with all things Flaro Superverse. So, if you are a CW superhero fan but didn't find the time to watch Supergirl season one on CBS and definitely don't have the time to catch up on it now because it's 20 episodes and an hour each, that's okay. I'm gonna sum up everything you need to know about season one and by the time we're done, you can totally lie and say you did watch the whole thing, and I'm sure she won't be able to tell the difference. I'm also gonna drop in some of my real opinions on the show as we go so you can put some little colorful flavor behind your lies. Okay, are you ready for all the spoilers? Cool. Starting with the basic essentials, part one of our video cheat sheet, the characters. Starting with the good guys and gals, let's talk about Kara Danvers, aka Supergirl herself. Side note, if you're thinking, isn't Kara Danvers already somebody? You might be thinking of Carol Danvers, who is the Marvel superhero, Captain Marvel. You can check out Sam's 101 on who that is, but back to our girl, Kara. Kara's real name is actually Kara Zor-El, and that's because she's like her more famous cousin Superman, also a Kryptonian. She was actually older than Superman back on Krypton, but when her mom sent her to Earth in a separate rocket ship to watch over her baby cousin, she got kind of lost along the way, and when she finally lands, she She's 13 years old and he's already a grown damn man. She gets taken in by the Danvers family and cut to a while later, she's 24 years old and she's working as an assistant to the CEO of CatCo, which is like a big old worldwide media company in National City where the show takes place. Kara is legitimately really likable. Like she's cute, but also she's kind of a mess and we really love her for it. You know how Clark Kent is a klutz, but when he becomes Superman, he's like super suave. That's not Kara. She's almost more awkward as Supergirl and that just becomes so relatable and she's She's just, oh, she's just so adorable. Oh, but something she does have in common with Clark, Kara basically uses the same exact disguise method and it still totally somehow works. Although, like in Not Another Teen Movie, when a girl rocks glasses and a ponytail, she's damn near a completely different person. And that girl from that movie, by the way, that actress is in this show too. That's Kyler Lee and she plays Kara's adoptive sister, Alex Danvers. Another quick shortcut opinion for you to adopt if you want, we like Alex. We find out pretty quickly on the show that she's actually a secret agent working for the DEO, which we'll get to that in a second, and she's got that Black Widow, White Canary badassness that we love. Here's maybe the most charming thing about her, even though it can get a little annoying sometimes. She's Kara's older sister, and even though she's just a normal human, she's dedicated her entire life to protecting her super strong alien sister. It's actually a big part of why she went to work for the DEO. Oh, so let's go ahead and get into that. The DEO stands for the Department of Extra Normal Operations. If you watch The Flash or Arrow, this group is the typical home base kind of team that identifies threats. They say the kind of thing like we've got a metahuman on the loose. Though they're actually supposed to only worry about aliens and they were actually created in secret when the world found out that Superman was an alien who could murder us all. It's also kind of like the DC equivalent to S.H.I.E.L.D. kind of. Agent Danvers' boss at the DEO, that's Hank Henshaw. Now if you know that name, it doesn't matter, ignore that because it's a different version of Hank Henshaw. In the comics that character does actually end up being Cyborg Superman, but here he's not that. He's just a regular guy in charge of the DEO, he's a bit of a father figure to Alex and later to Kyle. And she starts helping out there too. I guess that he does have this one little weird thing though. He's secretly the Martian Manhunter, also known as John Johns. Opinion wise, he was a little annoying at first, but eventually you learn that all Martian life has been wiped out. He's the last of his kind. And while he's being hunted, one of the people that was hunting him was Kara and Alex's dad, Jeremiah Danvers. And just before Jeremiah dies, John Johns promises to dedicate his life to keeping Kara and Alex safe, which is secretly why he shapeshifts into pretending to be Hank Henshaw, who died on that mission, and why he keeps the girls so close to him at the DEO. So after all that, yes, we like this guy. Also, when he's in Martian Manhunter form, he's a badass, like seriously. Rounding out the good guys list, we've got Wynn, who is Kara's quirky, friend-zoned pal, who's basically like her Felicity or Cisco. He's really good with computers and he's secretly in love with the main character. And yes, I'm saying Cisco secretly loves Barry, just keep going. We've also got James, don't call me Jimmy Olsen, who is the new art director at CatCo after quitting the Daily Planet because his relationship with Superman was distracting him or something. That part, honestly, is a little forced. Also, he's the main
main love interest for Kara, and that also feels a little bit forced, which is why their eventual kiss was kind of meh. Basically, just know that if you root for hashtag Quinn, you're good. And finally, we've got Kat Grant, who's played by Calista Flockhart. She's the CEO of CatCo and Kara's boss, and while the relationship is very Devil Wears Prada, it actually really surprisingly works. At first, you're a little like meh, but eventually she gets some of the best lines on the show. Now, she's kind of a mentor to Kara and Supergirl, and oh, also she pretty easily figures out that Kara is Supergirl, so she's pretty smart too. They kind of do undo that realization, but there are hints that she might still know that dirty little secret that Kara is keeping. Oh, and then there's Superman's boots and text messages. That's right, while we're gonna meet the guy in season two, the closest we get in season one is his dumb boots. It's honestly pretty lame and it gets kind of cringy when the only way Kara is able to talk to her cousin is either be a pass along message through James Olsen or an actual freaking text message. Good thing they're fixing that next season. Okay, so those are the good guys, now come the villains. Starting with the most interesting, we've got Astra. She's Kara's aunt and her late mom's twin sister, so it's real painful for Kara to look at her. Mostly because Astra is also basically a terrorist now. Those two love each other a lot actually, but Astra is an escaped convict. She and some other Kryptonian villains were actually in a Kryptonian prison called Fort Ross, and Kara's ship accidentally yanked it out of the Phantom Zone on its way to Earth, and she brought all these bad guys there with her. Hashtag Klutzy Kara. Anyway, we like Astra, even though she wants to enslave all of humanity. It kind of reminds you of maybe like Magneto in those movies, or maybe Loki if that's your bag. Moving on, Astra's husband, so Kara's step-uncle is Non, and he's okay. You should like him exactly as much as you'd like your step-uncle. Anyway, he's also anti-human, but without the caring for Kara, Ka caring that Asher has. Those are our two season-long villains, but we also get a few other appearances worth mentioning. First up, there's a toy man whose main thing to know is that he's actually Wynn's dad, and he really messes with Wynn's head a lot. Then there's normally a robotic hero, Red Tornado, but he shows up as kind of a bad guy, which is a little confusing, and he definitely gets the award for worst villain costume of the season, because what even is that? Silver Banshee is Wynn's girlfriend whose family is cursed and she's kinda just okay. I do like that her scream actually has some destructive power behind it rather than just being like an annoying car alarm. <coughs> Black Canary. Indigo also shows up, though you'd be forgiven for thinking that she's actually Mystique. And maybe the most interesting thing to point out about her is that the actress is the same one that played Supergirl in Smallville, Laura Vandervoot, and that she's very strongly connected to Brainiac, so that teases his potential future appearance, and that would be cool. But that's about all there is to say about her. Maxwell Lord is basically Supergirl's equivalent to Lex Luthor. He's super rich, super egotistic, Pretty annoying. He hates illegal aliens and thus he hates Supergirl and he doesn't actually do much this season except create another villain, the oh so tragic Bizarro Supergirl. Now, I don't know why Bizarro storylines always work on me, but this one just made me pretty sad. Kind of worked. Finally, a villain that no one is talking about is this news anchor, who is the news anchor on like every TV show ever. Clearly he's a time traveling dimension hopper and I hope he gets outed very soon. So now you've got a good grasp on who is in this thing, but what happens? So get ready because I'm about to throw about 20 hours of plot at you, but real fast and real condensed. Video cheat sheet part two, the story. In the pilot, Kara works at CatCo and hates her life because she's not Supergirl yet, but when she sees that her sister's plane is about to crash, she decides to come out of the closet and exposes herself as a superpowered alien and she saves the plane. This moment did make me actually tear up a little for some reason, so I guess that means it works pretty well, but I am also just scared of flying, so maybe it's just that. Alex is pissed that she exposed herself because remember, she's the overprotective sister and so Kara needs someone to be excited for her, so she tells friend zone, I mean Wynn, and we get our superhero costume montage where Wynn actually sews all the different variations on the costume himself, and again, man, sewing her clothes is not the way out of the friend zone. Then eventually Alex decides to go along with the Supergirl thing and reveals to Kara that she's actually a secret agent for the DEO, and long story short, too late! Supergirl starts helping with the DEO against extraterrestrial threats. We also meet Maxwell Lord, but like I said before, not much happens with him. Separate from other alien threats, we get some other attacks like Livewire, who's a pretty solid DC villain. She shows up, she hates Cat Grant, and she's kind of hard to defeat. And Red Tornado, I already said he's pretty lame, but Kara rages out really badly in a move taken from the recent Superman comic. She solar flares out, which means she expels all of her solar energy at once and freaking destroys him. And it's kind of awesome, but it means she loses her powers for a day. Then we learn that she can be a hero even without those powers when she stops a convenience store robbery, even though she might get shot and it might kill her and it's lifted directly from Superman's story in the comics and it's actually pretty cool. The fact that the head of the DEO, Hank, is secretly Martian Manhunter is a big huge secret and he doesn't want it to come out as that but eventually he does and because the DEO is supposed to protect us from aliens, he gets in trouble with his own group. They think he killed the original Hank Henshaw but he didn't and who cares because that guy was a jerk anyway. Oh and White Martians are the enemy of Green Martians and they are legitimately terrifying. Wynn's dad is Toy Man and tries to recruit him but it don't work and then we get a version of Alan Moore's for the man who has everything Superman story where Kara is attacked by the Black Mercy plant. 
thanks Uncle Nan, and she fantasizes about never having left Krypton, and we get a young Clark Kent who would have grown up there if it had never been blown up, and it's kind of sad because it means that Kara's biggest secret is that she still doesn't feel at home on Earth, super tier. Then Kara is exposed to some red kryptonite, which is basically like super cocaine, and she goes nuts and is actually kind of a cooler person to be honest, but kids don't do red kryptonite, and so Kara goes on a rampage and almost kills Alex, but sweet old Hank saves her by exposing himself. Then, just when she needs a friend the most, maybe in the best episode of the season, Barry Allen, aka The Flash, shows up and gets made fun of by Cat Grant and has unbelievable chemistry with Kara, and this actually works really well, so get super excited for the crossover that's next season. Then, remember Kara's adopted dad, Jeremiah? He was played by former Superman actor Dean Cain, the one that died. Well, it turns out he didn't die. The, the character didn't, not Dean Cain. He's been dead for years. I'm kidding. We don't fully solve that mystery this season, though. We know it has something to do with Cadmus. They have him. Cadmus, by the way, you might know from the comics, but so far on the show, we don't technically know anything about it, but it sounds like it's gonna be a really surprisingly like sinister version of that organization. Okay, then we're at the finale. All season long, Astra and Nan have been threatening to take over humankind. And oh yeah, by the way, Alex killed Astra with a kryptonite sword, which is actually a really cool weapon, but a really frustrating death because Astra was a really great character. So we're basically just down to Nan and Indigo for some reason. And again, she's still not important. So Nan uses a thing called Myriad to brainwash slash mind control all the humans on the planet. And there is one creepy sequence where people act like lemmings and they just walk off buildings and someone even dies and I don't know it's so sad but it was totally a character that we'd never even cared about so it didn't matter. Supergirl and John team up to save the day by literally ripping Indigo in half and Kara out eye blast Nan and this fight kind of worked for me especially when I thought she totally melted Nan's brain but now I think he might actually only be knocked out and just maybe blind or something we'll find that out next season too maybe. Kara then throws Fort Roz which was powering Myriad into space but almost dies in the process because I guess she doesn't know how to survive space yet or maybe she's just weaker than she is in the comics oh and she unbrainwashes everybody by widely broadcasting a message of hope, and it's pretty unsatisfying, actually. But the tear in half thing was pretty cool. But the real last end of the season, it's a mysterious Kryptonian rocket makes landfall, and what's inside? We don't know. And that's it. Oh, that's all of it. You're caught up on the story of Supergirl season one. Real quick though, let's do part three of our cheat sheet. What's this show like? If you got a sense that it's all about girl power and whatnot, you're not wrong actually. That is there, but they start taking it easy on those themes after about episode five. Then it kind of discovers its own dramas and it starts to feel honestly a lot like The Flash. It's definitely lighter in tone. And the big difference that I actually really like is that it's a story of one of the most powerful characters on TV who is not very good at being a hero. I think that's what'll make her a good fit in the CW lineup actually. She be the rookie. She's genuinely vulnerable and that's something that even Superman stories struggle to get right. Are there lame things? Yeah, sure, definitely. The costumes can be bleh. The fight scenes are hit or miss, no pun intended. The plot can be predictable. The villains aren't always threatening and the Ah, Superman, I am conversation. So yeah, there's some things that aren't great. But that's kind of par for the course on a lot of these shows. They aren't perfect, but at their best, they are a lot of fun. Also, one thing not explored on the other shows is how hard it is to keep your life stable when you're really trying to hide your secret identity. Something that not even Barry worries about that much. Also, it's worth watching if you're a fan of the Flareoverse just for the fact that it's going to expand the DC connection so much more. We've already had on the show Lucy and General Lane, Lois Lane's sister and dad. There's a really cool moment where we see a Legion of Superheroes ring inside the Fortress of Solitude. And we actually also saw one of those on Flash when Barry was between universes. There have been slick little references to badass cosmic bounty hunter Lobo, some hints at maybe Superboy showing up. Cadmus Labs is gonna be really interesting in contrast with Star Labs especially, since it sounds like they're gonna make Cadmus super creepy on this show. Finally, if you're wondering if the move to the CW is going to affect things a lot, yeah, it definitely will. The CW has gotten away with all these shows because it spends way less money on them. So we have yet to see how it'll directly affect Supergirl, but we know it already means we're gonna lose Calissa Flockhart as a series regular, which is actually a definite bummer, but honestly, she's just too expensive. She doesn't wanna relocate to Canada like everyone else, and this is weird but true. They do this weird thing where they blur and kinda like de-age her face with CGI on the show. It's really awkward because they don't do it for any other character, so it looks like she's in a dream every time they cut to her, and that's anyway just the kind of money CW does not have. Also, the special effects in general are probably gonna need to chill out because that's a big cost, and even the sets need to get simpler. I don't think it's a coincidence that at the end of season one, Cat Grant gives Carl a promotion so that she has her own office, but that office is like a small closet-like room with no windows. That sounds like a real cheap set to maintain. But onto the pros. The show will probably benefit a lot from the fun that's being had at the CW. We already know there's multiple crossovers in the works, one mega one with all the shows, and a freaking musical one that probably sounds really silly, but I'm very excited for because all of these actors are Broadway-worthy singers, and the super mentor relationship that works so well between Arrow and The Flash, I think that'll benefit Supergirl too, but with Flash now in that mentor role. 
especially by the way, if they want to hold back on bringing Superman on too often, that'd be a good way to do it. Also, this now means that Superman will exist in the Flaro Superverse, and that's crazy interesting. I mean, what if we got a Justice League someday? Probably not, but we can dream. At the least, we're probably gonna get a really fun moment when Diggle meets Supergirl. Okay, so that's it for Supergirl and for me. I think we did it, we probably got it all, but my question's for you. What do you think it's gonna mean for the Flaro Superverse to have the Kryptonians as part of it? I want Superman to meet the Atom, cause you know why. Uh, do you think also Barry's changing to the timeline last season is gonna affect Supergirl? It could. And speaking of, what do you think of a Barry Kara love story? It's not gonna happen, but still, they have all of the chemistry Hashtag slash, hashtag Kari, hashtag Farah, hashtag sorry win. All right, make sure to share this video with anybody you think might want to jump into Supergirl season two without having to put the work into binging season one. I've already done it for you. You can totally copy off my paper. This is how I make friends. Also, make sure to subscribe to SourceFed Nerd to get more one-on-ones like this explaining all sorts of nerdy things and to stay up to date with all that nerdy news that comes at us each and every day. I have been Philip Molina. Hit me up on Twitter at Fimo if you want to keep that conversation going, but for now, I am so wiped out. Bye-bye. It's coming. It's going. Oh, it says 10.30, that's why. Mm -hmm. 14, we're, oh, we're good? Hi. Hey. hey. Oh, it's look at us. us. Hey, hi.